Uh, Zoe Knox is NHPR's Community Engagement Coordinator, and she's going to share some of these stories and the impact that these people that we've lost to COVID-19 have had on their communities. So with that, I'm going to welcome Zoe Knox. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm glad to be here and talk a little bit about uh, NHPR, what we called our COVID-19 Remembrance Project. Um, so as you now know, I'm the community engagement producer here at New Hampshire Public Radio, and we launched our COVID-19 Remembrance Project in March of last year. Um, we've had a long-running coronavirus survey that the station had been running since the beginning of the pandemic, where our audience members could get in touch with us. They could ask us questions about how COVID is spreading in their communities, how to stay safe, questions about vaccines when that came to be the time. Um, and we also set up um, an email address that was dedicated specifically to coronavirus questions and for folks to share their stories with us. And so in uh, February and March of, of, of 2021, we were thinking about um, what is a way that we could um, share some stories of folks in New Hampshire who had lost their lives to COVID-19 and how can we um, really honor them and um, sort of combat that that feeling that you know we're seeing these kind of like coronavirus numbers every day um but how can we like remind ourselves and remind our listeners that like these are real people with with real stories um and so i'm going to share my screen with you to give us um a bit of a look at what our our page looked like. Um, so we launched this uh, web page on NHPR's website, um, Share Your Story with NHPR's COVID-19 Remembrance Project. Um, and so this was really the home um, for folks to get in touch with us. Um, and so we um, just wrote pretty much what I just told you. We were, um, it was on the country, had marked the milestone of 500,000 lives lost to the virus. And we were asking our listeners as they felt comfortable, um, our audience members to share the stories of loved ones that they may have had who, um, who may have died from COVID-19. Um, and so we had um, a bunch of different ways for folks to get in touch with us. We had a, um, a Google form that was linked on our website, which uh, was super easy for folks to fill out, just like their name, whatever story they wanted to share, um, and then a photo. Um, we also allowed people to get in touch with us via our coronavirus email account or um, via um, a web or a, a, a voice memo, excuse me. Um, and so our hope was really that we would be able to hear stories from all around the state to make it really easy um, for folks to get in touch with us and to share their stories. Um, and we want to make sure that we were sort of getting a, um, a diverse spread of locations. Um, and so there are a couple different ways that we um, tried to make sure that we heard from a lot of different folks. We reached out to folks who had gotten in touch with us um, via our survey in the past, um, folks that we had talked to um, from past stories. And we already, we also did some, some more targeted research to community groups, um, like folks who um, are part of the Home Care Alliance um, and also faith groups and churches um, to say, um, you know, please like share this um, with your congregation, with your community, um, if they have um, a story that they would like to share um, of someone who, who they had lost during the pandemic. And so as we compiled these stories, this was the, um, the finished product on our web page. We had um, nine stories that we hosted um, on this page, which may not sound like very many, but they were, um, the folks that we heard from were so kind and attentive um, to the stories they told. Um, and it was really like heartbreaking and also lovely um, to hear from them. And we, we really appreciated them sharing their stories with us. Um, so I thought there are, there are several stories on this page, um, but I thought I could, um, sort of highlight, read um, one or two of them to you. Um, and then of course I will share the, um, the link to this page in the Zoom chat um, if you would like to um, peruse more of them. Um, and so we just said at the top of the page, you know, we're again, we're marking uh, the one year anniversary of the first COVID-19 death in New Hampshire. We were gathering stories um, of folks in our state who passed away um, from the pandemic. And we were asking folks to share memories um, of their loved ones um, who died from the virus. So. One of the stories um, that we heard, uh, and we were hearing from folks in New Hampshire, but not all of their loved ones lived in New Hampshire. You know, we are all impacted um, by coronavirus in different ways. Um, and so um, 
This first one um, that I'm going to share with you um, is about a, um, a man named Rogelio, um, whom he was written um, about by his granddaughter. Um, and she wrote that my grandfather passed away in July 2020 at the height of the pandemic in Manila. We had no funeral service for him, no priest, no burial either. Uh, Lolo, which she called her grandfather, had to be cremated. I had already moved to New Hampshire by them, six continents, eight time zones, and several languages away. There was no going back. Lolo Roger, as we fondly called him, was a jeepney driver, the most common mode of transportation in the Philippines. My grandfather never set foot in New Hampshire or the East Coast. In fact, he never came to the States. All his life, he made a living just by driving his jeepney, collecting fares from passengers, and shouting out names of stopovers as he passed them by. I am one of his numerous grandchildren, the first one who migrated to another country, the first one who traveled elsewhere and decided this is where I wanted to stay. I think about New Hampshire as some sort of stopover for me, a place where I could end a journey and begin another one. I imagine my grandfather once again in his deep knee, just driving, driving until he reaches a stopover and hopped down, his life coming to an end, and at the same time, a new journey waiting for him to start. And um, that was another just like very heartbreaking tribute that Raina wrote, um, but very sweet. And I think um, this was sort of an example of the um, the global scope of the pandemic and the way that um, even though we were focusing on stories in New Hampshire, um, because that, you know, that is uh, where NHPR does our reporting that like folks who live in New Hampshire are really being, um, are seeing and are feeling um, the impacts of the pandemic all, all around the world. Um, and I'll share um, a highlight one one more um, of these stories for you to read aloud, and then, like I said, I, I will uh, share the link for you all to to peruse them on their own. Um, but this was um, a story written by a man named Woody Shook about his his mother Elizabeth, who lived in Keene, um, which is in New Hampshire. Um, and he wrote, my mother grew up in New York State before moving to Keene, New Hampshire. Anywhere she lived, she was always involved with her community. She volunteered with the Red Cross, served as a deacon and ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church, and was active in garden clubs. She was also an avid needlepoint creator and made the family new Christmas ornaments every year, dating back to the early 70s, which is a lot of ornaments. When she and my father moved from New York to Keene, they couldn't bring their prize Lionel train set, so they donated it to the Rochester Toy Museum. When she was a kid, her father would give her sweet pea flowers every year on her birthday. And when I learned this, I decided to continue the tradition. She knew the flowers immediately from their fragrance and they brought back childhood memories for her. My parents were married 70 years before my father passed away a few months before my mother. Throughout their marriage, my father, a former army cadet, teased her about an incident at an army navy game when he asked her to photograph the cadets walking in, but she took pictures of the midshipmen instead. She thought they looked better than the guys all dressed in gray. And she passed away in an assisted living facility on November 24th, just before Thanksgiving. Um, and Woody shared um, that really sweet uh, memory of his mom with us. Um, and. And I, I love how like poignant his writing is. And also, you know, he kind of shares some of the humor um, that he that he loved so much about his mother, which we really appreciated. Um, we have uh, many more stories on our website, but I want to give you just a little bit of a glimpse um, of what we what we wanted to do with a project to sort of make uh, a pandemic that was very global and sort of, um, I think, especially as journalists, we can feel sort of very beaten down by the data side of the pandemic um, to kind of remind ourselves and our readers of the like very uh, very personal side of the pandemic and the uh, the impacts that it was having on people in New Hampshire. And I also wanted to share with you, um, so NHPR is an NPR station. Um, so we, sorry, I'm just trying to, to find my right page. Um, so we are an NPR member station and our um, our national outlet NPR also did a um, a version of this project. Um, they did sort of their own remembrance project that was on a um, on a nationwide scale, um, and they had this uh, visualization um, on their website. And so what they did is they also asked. Similar to the way that um, NHPR did, they asked folks to get in touch with them to share stories um, about their loved ones who they had lost to COVID-19. And then they also reached out to um, their member stations all across the country, including NHPR. Um, many of our member stations did a similar project to this, asking folks in their community um, to share stories about folks that they had lost to COVID, 
Um, and so NPR reached out to their member stations all across the country um, and asked them to share um, to share their stories and stories that they had gathered. Um, and so this is a, um, a really beautiful visualization that they did. Um, and I'll share this this link with all of you as well, where you can um, kind of scroll through and it shows you on the map the different places. Um, that so we, we actually lost the NPR page. We're now looking at a Twitter page. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, that is, <laughs> here, I will go back and share it again with you. I know this is, this is the running joke that we have all, um, have all been doing this for so long and still, um, and still struggle with it. I will grab you the right one. Thank you for being so patient with me. Oh, we'll take just a moment while I'm pulling this up. Do you all have any any questions so far about how we um, how we went about doing our project? So Zoe, we also have a comment in the chat that there's also a similar project called Our Story. New Hampshire and hmm. it is reflections from the pandemic and beyond um, sounds similar and um, it's where people can share their stories about COVID or just about the past 18 months and uh, Paula Smith posted the link in in um, in in the chat and I do think that um, you know the stories that I've heard and that many of us have heard, especially at the beginning of the pandemic where, when people were not able to see their loved ones in nursing homes or in hospitals, um, was, were really tragic. And the, and the continuing loss that we're hearing about is just is so hard. And I think um, uh, Deborah, our keynote speaker's first presentation about um, mourning unmourned loss uh, as caregivers many of us um, especially in hospice have had to deal with just significant amounts of loss due to, to COVID-19 so I really commend NHPR for for doing uh, for sharing the stories because I think the stories are so important so we can see your page now okay I'm I'm sorry about that um nothing like a little bit of a little bit of zoom profile to uh to round out a presentation, um, but this is the um, the NPR page. Um, they called theirs um, "Enduring Loss." Um, like I said, they collected stories both from their audience and from NPR member stations. Um, so they have, as you scroll through the web page, um, you can view on their map where the different stories are from. Um, it includes some of the um, some of the quotes and the stories that were in um, NHPR's Remembrance Project as well. Um, but again, it just gives a, um, a sort of countrywide view um, of the pandemic as we were all going through it. And again, sort of like makes something that um, is very global, feel like very personal. Um, and as you um, click through the page, it takes you to the different um, the different stations, websites. Um, and I think um, for me and for our staff, it was also um, really informative and interesting to see how our um, our partner stations, um, the other member stations were um, marking different times in the pandemic in their communities. Um, and we're making sure that um, folks in their communities were able to get in touch with them and share their stories um, to make sure that we're both telling the um, the sort of like data driven side of the coronavirus pandemic, which is obviously very important to us, but also making sure that we never um, are losing sight of that human story and that, um, you know, as an engagement producer, like that is my job to make sure that we are, um, are telling those audience based stories as well. So I just want to make sure that we um, got to see both sides of both like what um, NHPR was doing and then what um, NPR was doing more broadly. Um, and so, yes, I think that was the, um, I know, a little bit under my time, but I think those were um, kind of the broad view of the project um, and what I wanted to make sure I shared with all of you. I will put the links to NHPR's project and NPR's in the chat. Um, and yeah, of course, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you folks might have. 
Do attendees have any questions or comments for Zoe? So Zoe's posting the links. Well, Zoe, thank you so much for sharing um, for sharing that um, information about uh, NHPR and NPR's projects. Um, so we are a little ahead of time and- Judy has want... one question. Oh, go ahead, Judy. I'm sorry, I missed that one. Yes, Judy. I'm just curious if, if these, this will continue as the deaths will continue, as COVID continues. Yeah, yeah, that is that is our plan. The um, the web page on our website is still is still live, and I still check on it. So, um, yeah, folks are are always welcome to to continue to share their stories, and we'll continue to update the web page um, as we hear from folks. And what, Zoe, one another question was: Would you be willing to take nurses' stories? Yes, of course. Yeah, um, the uh, email address, which I can I can put it in the chat too, um, that NHPR is using sort of for all our coronavirus coverage, is just coronavirus at nhpr.org, um, and we uh, will welcome like any questions or comments um, or stories that folks want to share. Um, I read every email that we get to that address. So um, yeah, nurses stories or um, if there's anything that you all want to share with NHPR that um, you think that more folks should know about, that would be a good story. Please get in touch with us anytime. Also, Zoe, I was wondering if you had any plans to also tell the stories of what they call long haulers, people who survived COVID but are really suffering some devastating health issues and loss issues themselves. Um, I just wonder if that wouldn't be a helpful healing forum to have that kind of targeted population for us all to learn from because those survivors are, are suffering. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes, absolutely. I know that that is something that is always on our our health reporters' minds. We've had a few um, a few shorter stories about. Um, we get a lot of questions from our listeners, like about um, long haul COVID and about um, how folks who have long haul COVID are doing. Um, and so we've had a few a few stories about that on our website. But I think it's always something that we're continuing to think about um, as as the pandemic continues. Absolutely. And we had another comment, uh, Dr. McMartin commented, thank you for doing this work. Telling these stories is really important. Yes, thank you. Um, these are really um, unprecedented times. So thank you so much, Zoe. Um, I, as I mentioned, these stories really shed a light on the losses we've experienced due to the COVID pandemic. And I think as hospice and palliative care professionals, we face loss and heartbreak more often than most other people. So our speakers today have challenged us to look deeper into ourselves to find resilience, to stay up to date on the most recent clinical practices for pain management, to know how to access VA service resources and care for dying veterans, and to understand the national hospice landscape and to compassionately care for families in crisis. We had a lot to take in today and um, and I really want to thank everybody for staying through this long. Um, so our keynoter, uh, Deborah Grassman, who's been um, a wonderful speaker, is going to share some final wisdom with us to close out our day. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Deborah. All right, hold on, let me see.